Welcome to our Pastured Pork Production webinar. Today is December 9th, 2015. Our presenters today are Paul Freed from the LCCW Farm and Nick Coster from Turkey Foot Farm. Today's webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT. To do a little bit of introductions, um, Food Animal Concerns Trust is a national nonprofit organization that promotes humane farming and advocates for the safe production of meat, milk, and eggs. FACT help cons helps consumers make humane and healthy choices. Our Fund a Farmer project award grants and facilitates peer-to-peer -peer farmer education to increase the number of animals that are raised humanely in this country. And our Humane Farming webinar series, which this is a part of, is just one component of that Fund a Farmer project. And I'd like to hand the mic over to my colleague, Larissa McKenna, to introduce our presenters. Oh, thank you, Lisa. This is Larissa. I'm a FACTS Associate Director, and along with Lisa, I help direct the Fund a Farmer project. And I am delighted to introduce our two presenters this afternoon, afternoon both of whom are also Fund a Farmer grant recipients in the past. Uh, our first presenter is Paul Freed of LCCW Farm, which stands for Lake City Catholic Worker Farm. And it's in Lake City, Minnesota, about 70 miles southeast of Minneapolis. In 2013, FACT awarded his farm a Fund a Farmer grant to build winter housing in the form of a hoop house, as well as watering systems for his hogs. And today, uh, Paul will be presenting about uh, holistic herd health. Our second presenter this afternoon will be Nick Coster of Turkey Foot Farm in Tama, Iowa. Uh, last year, 2000, or 2014, FACT awarded Turkey Foot Farm a Fund a Farmer grant to help the farm transition from raising hogs outdoors to using a rotational pasture system, um, complete with multiple pastures and water so sources. Today, Nick will be presenting on pasture planning and infrastructure. So we're thrilled to have them both with us today and thank them in advance for sharing their knowledge and their expertise. And I'm pretty sure a couple of jokes throughout this presentation. Uh, Paul and Nick will be available to answer your questions later uh, after the presentations are, are done, like uh, as Lisa mentioned. Uh, so now without further ado, I, Paul, please take it away. All right, thanks so much, Larissa, I appreciate the the warm introduction. So um, my name is Paul Freed from the Lake City Catholic Worker Farm. And as Alicia said, I'm going to talk about hog uh, health. And so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Um, so a little bit about us. Uh, we are in southeastern Minnesota. We have about four plus acres of pasture. We are, um, like Nick, we are moving towards a rotational grazing system. So I have about four acres in hard fence and we have started moving our pigs out to a, a non-hard fence, electrical fence area. So we have more than four acres of pasture now. We have three to four acres of organic veggies. We have a, a purebred large black boar named Billy. We've got some great red wattle and large black sows, and we're introducing some Berkshire gilts as well. Um, in addition, many, many, many thanks to Dr. Winter. He's a, a doctor of veterinary medicine out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, who I work with. Um, he is a vet, I am not, and almost everything I know about holistic herd health for hogs uh, and all animals comes from him, so my hat's off and kudos um, to him as well. Um, I also do some work with him as well. This is not on there, but I, um, I, I have, we have a very small side business where we sell nutrients and apple cider vinegar and things like that. Um, this is not a sales presentation by any means, but a lot of what I've learned comes from uh, talking to other farmers as well about how they raise their hogs and different problems that they have had. Um, our goals are uh, pretty straightforward. We want long-term natural herd health on our farm for boar, our boar, our sows, gilts, piglets, butcher hogs, and for us as well. And uh, we believe there's a connection between um, how healthy we are and our hogs and vice versa as well. We want humane treatment. That's why we're such fans of uh, fact. And we want to mimic nature as much as possible. Um, that's, that's our goal because in nature, hogs are naturally healthy. And so we want to mimic that as well. And right now we're trying to scale up for greater efficiency and also greater profits as well. But we want to do that uh, smartly and also uh, raise our pigs humanely. So to me, there's three uh, keys to, to herd health. And that's number one, understanding what a hog is. Um, number two, what do hogs need? And number three, how to assess and treat hogs if they are sick. 
So the key to all of that is to build up a natural immune system. That's just absolute paramount. Uh, in my presentation, you'll see I'm not going to talk at all about using antibiotics, dewormers, or anything like that, because we don't use any of those on our farm, and I don't promote any of those. We promote entirely a natural immune system. That is the key to raising hogs uh, humanely and raising them on pasture. Um, the, my non-scientific definition of hogs is a hog is a mammal and, a, and an omnivore. Um, and I'm treating them in, in, in about three different lifespans, my, uh, up to six weeks, which is my piglets and feeder pigs, six to nine months, which are my butcher hogs. Uh, that's about how long it takes to, to bring them to the weight of around 250 to 300 pounds. And then years of lifespan for my boar and for my sows. So um, it's important to note that because they are mammals and omnivores, they're just like us. So if you try to think about how you want to treat your animals, you really want to think about what is healthy for you. Um, because whatever is healthy for you is typically going to be healthy for your hogs. And it's hard to, for, it, I'm sorry, it's easy to forget that sometimes. And so you want to make sure that you remember when you think about a problem, what is it that would make my, my, me healthy or my kids healthy or other people healthy on my farm? That's typically what's going to make your hogs healthy um, as well. So hold on here. There we go. So what are the building blocks of hog health? And I've got kind of two tiers of, of hogs health. What do hogs need? Um, the, first, I'm going to go through the minimal requirements. The first thing is pasture. Pasture is fresh food. Fresh food is so important for any animal's health, especially hogs as well, being omnivores. And so on that pasture, they're not just eating one type of plant or just corn or soy or, or oats or whatever that might be. They're eating a variety of items out there, including some bugs, maybe mice and things like that as well. So that pasture is oh so important to them. To me, that's a, a minimum requirement. There's a lot of great producers out there who do some deep bedding systems as well, and, and that, that's good, and they, they sure can work with that. But for me, I'm a big proponent of, of uh, pasture, rotationally grazing pasture, uh, needing that fresh food. All right. They need space. Space is a huge thing that's important for hogs, and it's something that I think is underestimated a lot. Space equals less stress for your hogs. And just like humans and all, um, all mammals, the more stressed an animal is, the more often it's going to get sick. So that space allows them to interact with each other in a, a less stressful way. Um, a lot of people say hogs are as smart as a three-year-old. I have a three-year-old now. She's very smart but can be kind of cantankerous at times. And so you put a whole bunch of three-year-olds old, three together, and it's going to be a little crazy. They need their space. Um, that space would also include sun. Uh, again, being mammals, they get lots of uh, great um, benefits from being sun. Fresh air are very important. And like I said as well, it can be a deep-bedded system, but the goal in the long term would be to have them access to fresh air, fresh pasture, and things like that. If they're outdoors, there are three things also that they need. Number one would be shade. Uh, as probably you may know, pigs can get sunburned, and that's not good for them. Uh, that causes them to be stressed and so on. If they get overly hot, that's, uh, uh, that can be hard for them as well. So they also will need a wallow um, so that they can cool off in. It's pretty common knowledge that pigs are very clean but need the wallow to be able to cool themselves off on. Even on uh, days that I would think it would be not too hot for myself, they're still in the wallow. And they also need a windbreak as well. That windbreak is very important to keep them less stressed and to keep them warm, especially during the cooler months and into uh, the winter. They need good feed. And I know these things might seem straightforward, but it can be hard as you're, as you're scaling up to know these things and to keep them going. The feed needs to be clean and no mold. Mold is not good for pigs, just like it's not good for humans as well. Um, I had somebody uh, just call me up from a local place and wanted to donate a bunch of pumpkins that they didn't sell to our hogs. And I said, that's great. I drove out there and all the, ho all the, pigs, or all the pumpkins were moldy, so I, I couldn't take them. Um, the hogs might have ate them. They might have done all right with them, but ingesting that mold is not good for their overall, um, their overall health. Um, I encourage minerals and feed. That's something that's part of... Uh, of what I do uh, in this side business, but I encourage good minerals and feed. There are minerals that are not good, and there are minerals that are, are good. And so I encourage you to look around and see um, what kind of minerals uh, are your neighbors using. Um, lots of times the minerals that are in the feed from the feed mill um, are not typically a good mineral. Um, that's not to say I, I can't speak for every, every feed mill, but they want to you know, put the minimum they would need in to get those hogs to grow fast. So the feed that I get, that's, that's ground, that's pre-ground feed in there. I add my own good minerals too as well, and then I mix it in uh, right before I feed it to the pigs. Preferably no antibiotics. Uh, my local uh, feed mill, my local feed mills, you have to special order at least a ton to not have any antibiotics. 
And so that's important uh, to not have any antibiotics in there because um, that, that those antibiotics are going to contribute to long-term health problems, in my opinion, um, because they are killing off the good bacteria and such in the gut of the pig. Um, little to no junk food. I've also had people call me up and say, hey, I've got a truckload of donuts, or we've got uh, all kinds of bread, or the bakery will have all kinds of food. And, and, and those things are not necessarily good for people. I love donuts, of course, um, um, but um, they're not good for your hogs. And so I do give some things like that, bread and things like that, to my hogs, but I would not make it a major part um, of their diet. Fresh food and pasture is important, and also lysine is important um, as well. If you're going to be mixing your own feed, lysine is a limiting uh, agent for, um, for the growth of your hog. So lysine doesn't necessarily contribute to the health of the hog overall, but if you are making your own mix or you are relying on pasture, uh, so for on my farm, we feed about 40% feed, pre-mixed feed, and about 60% pasture, I've got to make up for that 60% pasture uh, in the, with the lysine. So I add, I mean, continue to add more lysine to my pre-mixed feed. And that's because lysine, and I'm not a scientist, but I, I've done a little bit of research on this, lysine's not readily av available in um, pasture unless you have lots of legumes on your pasture. And most farmers, uh, hog farmers such as myself, I don't want to say most, most that I know don't have any legumes or very few legumes uh, in their pasture. Um, so that's something that you want to be, uh, be um, attentive to as you're fix mixing your own feed. Okay, there's all kinds of breeds that you can use. This is kind of a small picture. It can be hard for people to read. But heritage breeds were raised to have natural health. So if you want to raise naturally healthy hogs, strongly recommend that you use uh, uh, the natural breeds. I've got large black, red wattle, Berkshire, but it's very important that you choose a breed you can find nearby. Um, I would love to have Gloucester Old Spot hogs, but I don't have many that people that raise them nearby to me. I might have to drive from Minnesota to Missouri just to get some breeding stock. So the people that were closest to me first had large black and then red wattles. And so um, starting with a breed nearby is really important because then you can have a great genetic base and also somebody that you can talk to as well. So I know that people like to look through books and say, oh, this is the breed I want, but I, it's, it's important to start with something um, that you can easily have a diverse genetic uh, material to work with. I, I do say start with anything. You know, if your neighbor has uh, some pigs they want to give you for the first year, go ahead and throw them out there with some pasture just to, to learn how to do it. That, that's not a bad idea. But most important is to support humane growers. There's not a lot of growers, especially in my area here in Minnesota, that are commercially selling feeder pigs. And so it's, do they cost more? They cost more, absolutely, because there's more um, labor involved. But you, you want to support that because that's the, that's, the, that's the important part of what we're doing here is to support each other as humane growers. Uh, best additional health options for hogs, we encourage people to free choice minerals, salt, and clay. Um, I, I use, a, like I said, a free choice mineral that is a mineral that would be a complete mineral for my hog. This is a, a, a kind of a, uh, not such a good picture there, but it's got a lot of different uh, minerals in it. It has very low amounts of salt, if any salt whatsoever, and no, fil no uh, fillers. So if you want to look for a good mineral, it's typically not going to have salt in it, although it might have some to improve the taste, but not lots of fillers like um, that might just improve the taste. You want mainly minerals that they can free choice. Salt is important for free choice as well, and clay can act as a detoxifier. Um, I, that's important to have free choice as well. And I, I have a theory in that when hogs are rooting around, one of the things that they're looking for is clay. All right, here's my free choice mineral feeder. It's a three hopper feeder there on the left hand side. It is well worth your time to train your hogs to consume those minerals. So they've got three hoppers on each side. One has free choice minerals, one has clay, one has salt. That, mineral, that middle picture there actually has the white powder on there is, um, is powdered sugar because it can take a little while to get your animals used to opening up the, hog, the, the mineral feeder and used to it, but it's, uh, it's, it's great once they do that. And you can see in the right picture, they actually put feed on top of that mineral feeder so they get used to it and they get curious and get their heads in there. Now, one thing to note, and I've struggled with this, is that poor minerals in your feed, so the minerals that my feed mill puts in for my hogs, can interfere with the hog's ability to free choice their own mineral because hogs and all animals have the ability to know what they need. And if you give them some of what they need, it can be hard for them to, to consume everything of what they need in those poor minerals. So I'm moving towards the, the spot where I'm actually not going to have my feed mill put any minerals in. They'll entirely free choice and I'll mix my own in. But it's just something to, something to be aware of.
Apple cider vinegar is one of the most important things we add to our uh, feed, add to the water. And we also 50-50 free choice it, meaning that if I have sick animals, I'll put out 50% uh, apple cider vinegar and 50% um, water. Um, I could go on and on about apple cider vinegar. If you're not using apple cider vinegar with uh, your animals, it's something to definitely take a look at. Um, is it needed for, for herd health? No. And I've kinda, I didn't say this, but I've kind of moved into um, what is, uh, what is um, above and beyond. So I said in here, I'm going to go back for a minute when I went to the breeds. You know, these are the good things that you need. You need good feed. They need pasture. They need fresh air. Now I'm kind of going into what are the additional things that can be helpful. Those additional things are the mineral, salt, and clay, and also the apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar is my parasite control, pro my control program, um, along with good minerals. So I don't give any dewormers whatsoever. Uh, if I see that some animals are having a problem with parasites, I add more apple cider vinegar to the feed uh, or to the water. It's a probiotic. It's great as an immune aid and tonic. It's filled with malic acid, malic acid and acetic acid, which is really great for digestive health. Uh, and I think it improves meat quality. It's 100% safe and it's cost effective. And at the Moses Organic Farmer Conference last year in 2015, yep, uh, there was a, a guy who gave a presentation saying that people who add apple cider vinegar to their feed um, can have 20% cost in feed reduction. That's something I've been playing with as well. So it's a great all-around tonic to help with the overall health. Um, of your animals. And there are some of those things there. I know you'll be able to check this out uh, on the recorded one of the, um, the recorded session so you can come back and look at some of those the benefits to doing apple cider vinegar. Other beneficial items, probiotics. Um, I sometimes will give my piglets probiotics as well to um, uh, in the feed a little bit. Diatomaceous earth can be helpful. There, I know that can be kind of, it's kind of a contentious thing. Some people think it works. Some people think it doesn't. For my hogs, if I have a, a major worm issue, I give them up to uh, 5 or 10% of their feed can be diatomaceous earth. Uh, the forest, having a forest for them to go in and find what they need, super helpful um, because pigs will find what they need to stay healthy. A calm attitude is important and, if possible, Rotational grazing. Rotational grazing, um, super important. Uh, a, a good rotational grazing has grass and hay ground. The best is intentionally planted items such as kale, beets, squash, pumpkins, corn, perennial plants, and all kinds of other things. Anything that you, uh, you think a hog would find in the forest is what you want to plant so that they can, do those, so that they can find those things on their own. How do you assess your hogs? So assessing and treating hogs. The top four, four things you can do when you assess your hogs is observe, 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 observe. So I'll, I'll do a tool like this where I'll take and I will put some fruit or some feed in a bucket right beyond the fence, and then I'll watch the hogs. And that's a great way to observe them. Another great way to observe them is just while they're eating as well. What do you want to observe? Breathing is very important. Look at their eyes to see if there's any watering. Um, this is also important when you're buying hogs as well. All these things would be important to check. How's their walking and what's their gait? What's their energy level? Um, I have one sow, uh, actually my first sow I ever got, um, she's got to be, I don't know, six or seven years old. No, she's got to be older than that. Um, but um, she actually has a, just a different energy than the rest of the hogs. She's the last one to get up in the morning, even though she's the boss. Um, but I can kind of, I had to adjust my, my expectations to see what her energy is so I can also uh, gauge whether she's ill or not. Um, how do they interact with other pigs? Do they have changes in behavior? What's their hair? This is a picture of the back of one of my red wattle um, sows. And you'll see, if you can see closely there, the hand, the, there's some black hair kind of standing up a little bit. And I'm not quite sure if that's natural or not, but that's just happened in about the last three months. And so I've increased my minerals. I'm definitely keeping an eye on that to see if that's something that I think is, is a problem or not. Um, do they have a fever? When I walk out, uh, if you watch me walk around my hogs, you would see I'm frequently putting my hands on my hogs um, just to feel what their temperature is. And one of the most important things to look at is poop. Right? And I can't do this without having some type of a poop joke. Um, but poop itself is a joke. So here we go. This is good poop. That's a poop that's nice and firm. And um, it looks like human poop, right? Again, these are um, they're mammals just like us. So you would compare it to what your own poop is as well. This is not so good. It's a little bit mushy there. And there's bad poop. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not totally diarrhea, which is the worst. <clears throat> but this is uh, poop that is very mushy. This guy was caught in the act here, right? It can be hard to catch a p uh, pig that poops, but diarrhea will typically show on the rear of the hog, so you'll see that up there as it kind of smeared. And most ho hogs typically have a morning constitution, my hogs do, um, around feed time. So I'll walk around, and I can smell it. So as soon as I smell some poop, I'll kind of look around to see who's pooping and, and what they're doing there. All right, help. We have a sick pig. What can you do? Okay. 
First thing I would say, if you've got a sick pig, number one, treat it like a sick kid. Keep it at home from school and have it watch the prices right all morning long. That's what my mom did for me, and I'm super healthy today. So that would be the number one thing that I would do right there. Okay? Um, but seriously, uh, you want to make sure to uh, separate that pig out and give it clean water and apple cider vinegar, um, extra minerals in the feed, free choice clay and salt, um, fresh veggies, very important, Low stress, I would not put the pig in a small cage. And sometimes if I think a pig is kind of sick, I'll put another pig with it just for company. Pigs don't like to be alone. Um, and so just separating them into a larger area where they can walk around um, and live their normal life but have greater access to, to um, the minerals to the feed. And I think that you know when a pig is sick, it's not as energetic. It doesn't get up right away in the morning as quickly, so it's not going to get as much feed, and that can really be a snowball effect there. So by just by separating them and then by giving them all the feed that they need with all the minerals in it, you're ensuring that they're getting what they need to heal naturally, and that's what we want, right? We have naturally healthy pigs that are naturally going to heal. Um, you can also do probiotics and so on, but what if as a pig is really sick? If a pig is really sick, I've got about well, six things that you need to know. Number one, talk to people who raise hogs. Even conventional people who raise hogs can be helpful. They might tell you, uh, you might think they're going to say, hey, give it this medicine or that medicine, but that's not always true. Um, conventional people who raise hogs, who raise you know, a lot of hogs, know a lot about hogs. And so that should not be diminished by any way. They're a great resource. They're going to be friends of yours. Um, they're typically farmers that are just, you know, are doing their best just like we are. So talk to anybody who raises hogs from just a couple up to a, a large scale. Number two, do some research online. There's lots of good research. There's some great um, Facebook groups of, of pastured hogs that uh, can be really helpful where you can put um, questions out there. Uh, number three is really important. Give the hog time to get better. Just like people, they don't get better overnight. So give them a week or two weeks to get better. If a hog is really sick, I think you basically have got two options. Uh, this is number four. You can call the vet if you want to. Uh, in my history of raising hogs, I've only called the vet once, and that's when I had a hog that could not birth babies on her own. She had one, and she was just laboring, laboring, laboring. Couldn't do it, couldn't do it. The, he, the vet came out and said, she's not going to have them. You're going to have to call that hog. So we had to call, um, uh, unfortunately, very unfortunately, that was one of the worst days uh, for us here on the farm, to call a, a hog that was um, trying to have babies. And so number five is important. If you're going to raise hogs, you should be prepared to call a hog if it's super sick um, because uh, that just is something that needs to happen sometimes um, uh, in that situation. And number six, just remember that's a learning process. I, I definitely am never happy if I have to call a hog, which has been very rare for me, um, I think two in the last six years. Um, but it's something that you want to be, be ready to do. In addition, I would encourage you to butcher and inspect one of your hogs every year. That is super, super, super important. When you butcher that hog and you open that hog up, you want to observe. Look at the liver. Look at the lungs. Look at the heart. What's out of the ordinary? If there's something that is out of the ordinary, and you can find all kinds of pictures online of what, what good internal organs look like. If there's something out of the ordinary, find out what it is and what it's telling you because that's going to tell you how your hogs are doing um, overall. So that's all I have on holistic herd health with hogs, and I appreciate your time today. And now I'm going to pass it off to um, to Nick. Nick, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Absolutely. I can hear you. Thanks so much, Nick. Okay, great. Well, that was a great presentation. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll just go on and uh, introduce myself here. My name is Nick Coster. Um, our farm is Turkey Foot Farm, and I run it with my wife, although we both have day jobs, so I feel like I need to preface that. Um, if, uh, I'm going to try to run through things fairly quickly here today, so I'm uh, going to cover a lot of basic planning information. If you have any questions or want to follow up, there's my phone number and email. Uh, feel free to contact me. Um, basically, my background is that I've been involved in uh, various aspects of residential, commercial, and agricultural, agricultural construction for um, the last couple decades. And um, I've done quite a bit of uh, infrastructure planning, both for residences and uh, farm-type uh, situations. Um, right now, I am currently uh, working for Grinnell College as the field station maintenance technician at the Conard Environmental Research Area. And that's basically a 380-acre restored prairie and oak savanna. And so we uh, work on a lot of different aspects of prairie restoration and um, also research involving prairie studies. Um, my farm history, I uh, basically 
uh, spent a lot of time on different farms ever since I was a, a young kid, uh, dairy and some beef and uh, some uh, lamb operations and that kind of thing. Um, I got into my own farming um, about 10 to 12 years ago with chickens and turkeys, and about six or uh, about seven years ago, I started my uh, breeding program with hogs. I started small. Um, you know, a couple years before that, I raised some feeders out and kind of got my feet wet, which I think is a great experience, and I'd highly recommend it if you're thinking uh, into getting into hogs. I know Paul touched on that earlier. And uh, right now we have about uh, generally a herd of about 60 to 100 hogs, and um, we have uh, a variety of different breeds that we're working in with, but uh, mainly Cooney Cooney and Ossabaw. Um, just a quick overview. Uh, a lot of people will be planning before they have livestock. That's probably the best case scenario, but you can also, you know, get your feet wet, kind of have it be a hobby, and you'll be modifying existing premises or building new structures. Either way, the main thing you need to consider is the maximum number of animals and the groupings of those animals. And, uh, you know, with my experience, I always like to kind of tend towards my facilities being a little bit oversized that way, um, you know, you don't have uh, the upgrading the infrastructure costs if your enterprise turns out being rather successful. Um, talking about the ideal situation, uh, just to be straightforward, we haven't finished every last one of these projects on our farm. I have uh, completed many similar projects on other people's farms, but these are things that we aspire to and are close to on a lot of uh, levels or completed on some, in some areas. That's just a picture of our, out front of our farm. Uh, real quick overview, we generally have between 5 and 12 breeding sows. Uh, we have 1 to 3 boars. Right now we have 3 just because we're working on doing some crossbreeding, um, and those have to be kept separate. Um, we have a space for about 20 weaned piglets that when we pull them off the teat, we put them in there for roughly a month to 6 weeks to get them onto solid feed. And, uh, and really when we pull them, they're already eating solid feed with their mothers, I might mention. Um, and... Uh, I also have a space for 20 to 40 feeders uh, in two groups. Uh, quick note, um, my understanding is that pig social groups don't really extend much beyond 20 members, and so we try to limit our herds, if we can, to about 20 pigs because uh, it helps keep them calm and uh, keep them from uh, fighting or getting too excited with each other. That's one of our uh, breeding boars. That's a purebred uh, Ossabaw right there. And these are some of our feeders eating some uh, brewer's grains that we use as a supplement that we get from a local brewery. Uh, space requirements can really vary de dependent on um, your location, uh, the grade, the type of soils, the type of uh, weather and that type of thing that you get in your area. A lot of times, you know, there will be low-lying areas when it rains. You have to take that into consideration when you're going to be putting up buildings or waters or feed areas. Um, and also an ideal progression of the herd from one space to another. Moving pigs around is not that fun, and it's really nice if you have uh, a good setup and a good way of containing them. If anybody escapes, they're not going to get off the farm and end up trying to, you know, go into your neighbor's 12-foot high cornfield and hide for months on end. Um, and also, you know, I, I plan for some sacrifice areas, areas around waters, areas where I'm going to keep groups of hogs over the winter where they're just going to tear up pasture if they're out there for too long. Um, that's, that's my take on it. Other people do different, um, different varieties of that. And one of the things I've utilized a lot is uh, satellite maps. Google, Google Earth is a great uh, um, program to use. You can... Uh, take overhead uh, views and zoom up on them, and then you can also modify them and add in. This is a little bit blurry, but essentially you can see you can just use a measuring tool on there and figure out exactly the length of your fences and how you're going to divide things up. So it's pretty good free, free software to, to use when you're playing stuff out, and also measurements for water lines, electrical runs, that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to go over five main areas, access fencing, water supply, electrical supply, and shelter. And I'm going to try to use some language and terminology um, that might be a little bit uh, clunky as far as an everyday conversation, but it's kind of what you would need to um, procure things if you're talking to, say, a salesperson or, um, you know, some local farmer that you're trying to get used equipment from, that kind of thing. And I would also say that we live in the Midwest, and we're fair to finish. So 
you might not need this much infrastructure if you're just raising out some feeders, you know, three season, seasons a year, or if you're in a little bit warmer climate, that type of stuff. Um, you know, a lot of what I'm talking about here is, and a lot of what the challenge is in Iowa here is, is overwintering and dealing with uh, freezing temperatures. So access. Number one, supplies in. You gotta be able to drive around, get, uh, probably a trailer in and out of there, uh, tractor implements. Obviously, I mentioned before, being able to easily move livestock around, um, moving manure and bedding from both to and from shelters, well, bedding to and manure from, and also a location of existing hazards, basically, things you don't want to have to dig through, uh, trees that you want to keep, um, you know, you don't want to be, I have a situation where I'm kind of tearing up my lawn because to get to one of the existing buildings, I drive across it, and it, it's, you know, it's kind of slowly creating a mud road there. So, you know, things like that are worth, uh, worth planning out if you can. There's a couple pictures of just some little access ways as far as uh, being able to drive. That's my lovely wife, Jennifer, driving the tractor there. Um, there's three different types of fencing we use. Uh, the first type is a woven wire with a stinger at 10 inches on the interior, exterior run. So basically I like to have a, some kind of hard fence around all my divided up pastures and such. Um, just to make sure if somebody, you know, electricity goes down, um, that a hog can, uh, can again, escape and become a real problem. Um, for fencing in boars or separating boars from sows, uh, we use almost exclusively hog panel, eight foot on center, um, T posts, and at least three ties per post, and really good ties, too. Um, and uh, it's nice to have a stinger. It keeps them from rooting around the fence and stuff, but... You know, you can get away with it for months at a time. It's just if it's a long-term area that the hogs are in frequently, they're eventually going to kind of tear up around your posts and the bottom of your fence. And then uh, for the temporary fences and um, for dividing up the pastures, I use a three-strand electrical tape. So i got a couple pictures of those. Uh, on the left, you'll see the woven wire with the stinger. That's like one of our, you'll see the road is off to the right of that picture. And then um, on the right, and I would say that this is about as loose as I would ever let it get, but um, there is our three-strand electrical just with step-in posts. And I'd add, too, that, uh, you know, a lot of these pictures were kind of taken in off-season, so it's not, the, not as beautiful as Paul's uh, nice greenery that he's got, um, but uh, it is what it is, I guess. As far as the water supply goes, um, I always put in frost-free hydrants. Uh, you want to have all your supply lines below the frost line. If you're at 48 inches, you're pretty much good anywhere in the country. And I recommend using at least one inch line coming from your water source, whether it's a well or rural water, or even if you have a tank with a pump in a heated area. Uh, and then always, you want to always put P rock around the base of the hydrant so that there's some place for that water to drain out when it's going back below the frost level. Um, Automatic waters, uh, we use a frost-free Smidley style water, and I do have a graphic after this to kind of explain what I'm uh, literating here, but um, essentially uh, we come off our one inch main line with a three quarter inch supply line. Um, you need a minimum of 14 gauge wire, that's a 14 two wire that also has a ground, so there's actually three strands in it. And it needs to be UF rated, which means that it's the gray stuff that you can bury, direct bury underground. And uh, you have to have at least a 15 amp breaker on it, but that's plenty. Most of the heaters only take uh, 500 to 1,000 watts. And uh, I also pour them on top of a pad that is, has the outside lips turned down so that uh, you don't have hogs or rats or whatever else trying to dig up underneath of your waterers. And then I use just a polyethylene plastic riser that is... Uh, probably about four feet long to both insulate and have your water and electrical lines coming up through. So that's a top view of one of these Smidley style waterers. And this is kind of a side, just a basic side view of water line. Some rock around the bottom where your lines are coming, transitioning there so they don't get crushed by anything. And there's good drainage in case you get groundwater coming in there. I also use some portable tanks. Um, and you can use submersible heaters in them is generally what I use. Um, just need to make sure your cords are out of the way of your hogs. And um, I also use some stock tanks around. They ice over occasionally, or I'll throw a, a submersible in there in the wintertime, but it's nice so that we don't have to haul the hose everywhere. We can fill those up and then bucket out of it for smaller water dishes. 
Here's a picture of one of my, this is kind of what I like to call a sacrifice area. I've got a water here. When I empty it out and clean it out a couple times a week, it basically fills that wall for them. And it's always going to be a little bit muddy there, but, uh, you know, this is basically an area that I'm, I'm figuring is going to be torn up, and so I don't bother to replant it all the time. I would say that I do let those areas rest a couple times a year, though, to keep down on parasite load. Electrical supply, um, basically you need to go through and think about what you're going to be running and add it all up and then figure a percentage above that. There's a lot of good books on that, and you can certainly ask me questions in detail about it later. Um, our whole farm runs off a 60-amp sub-panel that's coming off of our house, and then there's another 30-amp panel um, for the waters and the sensor that's a little closer to the pasture. That, that's those two panels. Notice that, you know, if you make a nice painted mount and put a little roof over it, it'll add tons of life to these things and make them a lot safer as far as not corroding and that type of thing. And I also always use these outlet covers that you can run a cord through and they're still relatively waterproof. Um, solar fencing is a good idea. It doesn't, you know, you're not going to get uh, enough power out of solar to keep your water thawed, but I use it a lot of times in, uh, you know, spring, summer, fall pasture areas. And some basics of shelter. I recycle a lot of things for my shelter. I've got some pictures after this slide. Um, but basically, you want your open end of your huts out of the prevailing wind. You want lots of deep bedding so when it gets cold, they can bury themselves down in it. And uh, you want to put it on a high spot that water runs away from it, which is particularly important with the permanent shelter. Um, and then, you know, there's often good existing structures, and uh, you can also build new structures, but again, you really want to think about those locations before you invest money into something like that. Really try to have a good overall plan before you get going. Um, even if you don't have the money for it immediately and you're going to start small, it's nice to think ahead so that you're not having to redo stuff. That's, that's personally my least favorite thing to redo. Um, and again, considering accessibility and sensing needs while you're planning that stuff. I use a lot of portable structures. Um, I find them to be more economical. There's uh, a lot more options with them, but they also require some upkeep, and pigs tend to kind of beat them up. They're big, tough animals. And I've had a few of them blow over in big windstorms. Uh, what we use is uh, some large salvaged polyethylene tanks. Um, I also have cut up some horse trailers to make some shelters. And um, I also have... Uh, uh, a government bin that I cut in half vertically and use for like a Quonset uh, type uh, housing for, you can get uh, probably 15 or 20 hogs in there. And the Class A frame huts are great. We just uh, have other stuff, so we don't personally use them, but I'd, I'd recommend them. I know a lot of people that have a lot of success with them. A couple pictures. That's uh, basically a polyethylene tank converted into a small shelter. Um, and then this is one of my boar huts. That's four boars all curled up sleeping in there, and that's uh, that's made out of a horse trailer lid. And that is uh, one of the small quonsets we call, and that's a picture of the interior of it. There's a sow with some uh, pigs in there. And uh, this, I just put cement around it since it was going to be permanent uh, just to kind of anchor it down and uh, keep stuff from digging in there. So I'd uh, very much like to thank you for tuning in today, if that's the proper thing to say. Um, and uh, I'd like to also thank FACT. I've had a great time working with them and uh, would highly recommend, uh, you know, keeping up with what they have going on. They're really um, a great organization. And uh, I guess we're going to start some uh, uh, Q&A now. Thanks so much, um, Nick and Paul, for your presentations. This is Lisa again. Uh, I just want to cue everyone um, that you can type your questions for our presenters in the little chat sidebar, uh, the bottom left-hand side of your screen. And uh, what I'm going to do is I will read questions one at a time, uh, and then the presenters can, can respond to them. I'm going to scroll back up. Some folks asked questions at the beginning, uh, so let me see if I can find those first. All right, so we had one question, which maybe was covered, but um, Andy Stevens was asking about, um, this would be for Paul, about specifically what minerals do you add to your feed? Um, so I don't know if that's still something, uh, uh, if any sure. more know about that, Paul. Paul, can you hear me, Lisa? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, we, I actually sell a, a 
a mineral. But what I like to tell people, because this is not a sales presentation by any means, is that you want to look for a place that is reputable. So one place that's really that you can look to as a reference is like Fertrell. Um, they're nationally known. So sometimes when people will say, should I use this mineral or should I use that mineral? Lots of times they'll say, well, pull up what Fertrell has. Um, it's just a baseline, um, and that, that can give you a good example of something that you can look for. But lots of times there's place, something that you can get at least in your state, maybe not at your, your local feed store, but um, find, a, find a good mix, what, what would be in that mix, and then you can have at least a, a baseline to compare it to. Great. And here's another question um, also from earlier during Paul's presentation from Robert Thompson. Why clay as a feed additive? Sure. Clay is um, it's a detoxifier plain and simple. So pigs will eat things that are not good for them just by being on pasture. There's molds out there. There's different types of things that they're going to eat. And so clay is a natural detoxifier and it helps with their overall digestion. Okay, great. Um, and this one um, potentially, I guess, could be for either of you, um, maybe more for Nick. Uh, we have a question from Tim Livingston. Any tips on farrowing systems? Um, yeah, I would say there's a lot of great uh, systems and plans out there for um, fairly complex huts, really, as far as they go. I personally take a pretty simple route, which is that uh, we provide multiple huts if we have sows fairing at the same time. Although, if we're going to be offset by more than a couple days, they will co-parent. And so I do try to keep them uh, separate if they're going to be offset and fairing for more than a couple days because the bigger pigs will outcompete the, 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 the first-born ones for uh, the colostrum. But that being said, we use a hut with very deep bedding. Um, I don't have a whole lot of uh, crushing issues, although uh, the pigs that I raise have a little bit shorter stature and uh, shorter legs, and they're also really good mothers. So um, I think depending on what breed that you're raising, um, you might want to look at something to where the pigs have some place to go and, uh, you know, get away from the mother after they're nursing so the mother doesn't step on them. I think Paul would probably have some input on this as well. Um, but, and I would also say that uh, there's, uh, I noticed just on one of these questions, I'll just address it while we're talking about farrowing now, that people talked a little, about, a little bit about winter farrowing. And, um, you know, my experience is with the breeds that I'm working with, obviously, but I've had almost better luck with winter, winter farrowing than summer farrowing. And you go out there and you think, how can those little things survive in this cold? But they bury in there, and they, they, um, they really do. Uh, we don't do supplemental heat and that kind of thing. And, I mean, my attitude is to be, you know, to treat the animals with respect, but also let them, um, you know, sort out basically um, being able to survive and be good farrowers in, in all seasons. And um, so I don't uh, supplement with heat lamps and that type of thing to answer that question as well. Great, thank you. Yeah, the question from Helen Cabot about winter farrowing uh, was, what do you use to keep piglets warm, just bedding, heat lamps, size of shelters? Um, Paul, did you, did you want to add anything to that question? No, just a few things. Uh, Nick is right on the money. You know, I, we do winter farrowing. We actually, right now, when I came in, we're actually building a greenhouse for to help with winter farrowing. We're in Minnesota. We're a little farther north, so we do a heat lamp that is very well protected because hogs, uh, very important, the hogs should not be able to get to the heat lamp. Um, that's how barns burn down. So you, you, we do a little supplemental heating, make sure it's protective, and we also have a little spot for the hogs that they can get out of the way as well. Uh, Nick touched on it. Good mothers typically come from um, breeds that uh, are heritage breeds. So that's a great way to choose your mothers. Or I can't say that as a rule, but uh, if, a, if a mom is not a good mom for our piglets, then she would get, um, get culled. I, I'd like to also just butt in here too with a, a side comment on Paul's safety warning there, which is that um, I'm a little embarrassed to admit it because I really do try very hard to suspend them well and do a good job of keeping them away from water dishes because splashes can crack the glass light bulbs. But I have had three fires from heating lamps, and I am done. So just general, general warning, I don't trust heating lamps at all. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you for sharing, both of you, on that. Um, here's a quick question for Paul um, from Paul Brown. What kind of lysine are you adding into your mixed feed? You know, I saw that one. I was hoping you weren't going to ask me that one, Lisa. I actually, I just, you can say the pass. That is, I have my feed mill add the lysine in, more lysine for me. So I can't even 
say what that is, um, although I, I, I'm going to have to do some research because that's something I'm looking at. That's one of my winter projects is to do more research on lysine so I can control it better myself. But since I have my feed custom mixed, they'll custom mix it any, the way, any way I want. And so uh -huh. I just ask them to double my lysine. Gotcha. Here's another one. Um, what is the uh, apple cider vinegar to water ratio when using large water tanks from Ella Barlow? That's a great question. We, we do um, a half a cup per five gallons. Half a cup per five gallons. Half a okay. cup per five gallons of water is kind of a maintenance for animals. And the reason we had that in, that's not just for hogs, that's for any animals because um, you can, animals typically in nature don't eat as much grain as we give them. Um, even hogs, even spent grains and things like that, which are really fantastic. So that helps to adjust the acid in the stomach that would be naturally occurring more in a, a, a forest-raised hog. Great. Thank you. Um, here's a question maybe for, for Nick from Jennifer Havens. How do you figure out space requirements on pasture per pig? When do you move them to maximize pasture? Yeah, that's something that um, I'd hope to elaborate on a little bit because I think that, uh, and I think that Paul and I take different tacks on it perhaps, so it'll be interesting to hear what he has to say. Um, right now where we are in our setup, we are basically um, doing overseeding and also replanting some pasture um, in each season. And so, um, but I'm also trying to build the soil a bit because we recently converted it from row crops. So it's not something that was existing pasture. So that's kind of a little bit of a different animal. But um, unfortunately, I, and I think this is part of the reason that it's really hard to find good statistics on this is that it's very weather dependent, soil dependent, and um, you know, grade dependent. I mean, if you have a bunch of animals that are uh, on a grade and water's washing through there and they make pass, it'll start to, to, to run it out, you know. And so I really think the thing to do is to start off with less animals than you think you have room for and rotate those animals um, before they do too much damage each time, especially if you're going to try to preserve the existing um, grasses and forbs that are in your pasture. Um, what I've been doing to establish is using a mix of annual and perennial rye, oats, field peas for some protein, uh, canola, also known as rapeseed, field uh, radishes, and uh, sorghum sedan grass. And uh, that's what we put down initially for the first couple years to um, help build the soil and uh, give the pigs something good to munch on and get some better biomatter built up in the soil. But I think it's a really hard question to answer. Paul, do you have any input on that as far as a pig, pigs per acre type of scenario? I don't. That's something I'm going to be testing out a little bit this year. But, I mean, the other thing, Nick, as you know, uh, I'm sure, is that the age of the hog, the size of the hog, all, you know, how much rain. I, my rule of thumb is to tell people when they ask me that question, just know that the hogs are going to tear up your pasture, right? I mean, just it, you can plan to move them, and, and having a sacrifice area is really important so that when it gets really muddy, you can get them off the pasture and bring them uh, bring them back there. So that's something I think that a lot of work needs to be done just to say at what age, how many hogs can you put in a certain area, but it's, it's a lot of just feeling it out and um, having a place to put them when they start to really root up. Great. Um, I have a couple of questions that, that people have written in about um, the slides and the recording. So I just wanted to say really quickly, yes, we are recording this and uh, a, a link to the recording will be made available on our Fund a Farmer website. We also will send that link out directly to everyone who registered for the webinar. And I just shared a link, um, it should be visible in the chat sidebar um, to download the presentation slides. So if you just want the slides, not the recording, um, just follow that link and you should be able to download it. We also make that available uh, on our website um, probably tomorrow uh, if you wanna check back. Um, we do have a fencing question from Tiffany Tripp. Um, what do you use for fencing in the winter time? Uh, she says that they're going to raise five hogs that will have a permanent shelter and will have access to a nearby wooded area. They were hoping to use electrical fencing, but I've heard that might not be best for winter. Are hog panels our best option or what is another alternative? Okay, I would say, um, you know, probably the least expensive option is using the electrical. Um, and I have successfully done it during the winter. Sometimes you have some problems with drifting, but um, with the step-in posts, 
Um, you know, you can slide. I go around and slide my bo- my bottom wire up a little bit during the winter time if I have drifts, and I don't think I've gone as far as shoveling around them. I still think it's a good idea to have at least a woven wire exterior fence like I pictured there. And it depends on where you are in the country. You know, Big Ag has been tearing out so many fences over the last decade that a lot of times if you look around or ask a neighbor if you're in the country, they'll have piles of fencing that they've gotten rid of just so they can get bigger equipment into the field. So I've gotten a lot of my fencing for for cheap or free as far as putting hard fence in, but uh, it's also a lot more work. The electric electrical, you can put up a, a lot of fence in a day with it. And uh, so, you know, um, but I also would say that I do kind of tend to train my pigs in with electrical on the inside of, of a hard fence. I mean, hog panel would be the ultimate. I'd love to put hog panel up everywhere, but it's the least affordable. I mean, you know, most of the time it's running between 25 and $35 for 16 feet, which uh, that buys a heck of a lot of your other options. So I guess that's, that's where I'd go with that. I, I agree with everything that Nick said. I also want to say it's really important if you have that, that small amount of pigs and you're just getting started, feed them with a bucket because uh, they'll follow you everywhere. And so if they get out, uh, then they'll follow you right back in lots of times, hopefully, with the bucket. But some people I know that I've talked to, they've had problems because they'll put it in a, a big feeder or they don't step in with the hogs or whatever it might be. And so the hogs don't get used to you being the, the source of food. So when you start out, make sure to feed them with the bucket or whatever so that they'll follow you around. So if they do get out, then you can at least kind of bring them back. Great. Thank you, guys. I have a a particular truck that I drive around the farm for chores, and all I have to do is get in there and start the ignition, and everybody starts squealing. So. (laughs) Um, We have a couple of questions about pig nutrition. I'm going to read a few of them, and and you guys can respond. Um, One of them from, from Dave is what are a few plants to add to your pasture mix to increase pig nutrition? And then there was another question um, from Nick King about have any of you had experience in fermenting grains for your hogs? If so, have you had any success? Um, And then there was another question about um, in Fort Collins, there's an abundance of spent grains. And how much would you feed a pig per day if you're supplementing uh, on pasture? So, uh, pig nutrition. Nick, do you want to go first? Um, I could touch on the spent grain for sure really quick. Um, uh, We have a brewery that we get spent grain from, and, uh, you know, it has some pretty good protein numbers to it. Um, You know, it depends on how well it's drained off. I think sometimes it can be sugary. I mean, like uh, Paul mentioned, we don't want to always be feeding our our hogs, uh, you know, junk food, so to speak. But I do believe there's some good nutritional value there. I cut down on my protein and the rest of my ration, and I use it for a supplemental ration. Um, I would never go more than 50% on it, um, and generally I try not to exceed 25. Um, yeah, sometimes, sometimes do I dump a loader bucket of it in there, like in that picture, and they just eat that that day? Yeah but um, not day after day after day, and I make sure that they have a lot of, uh, you know, either corn stover or um, straw or grass or other type of things to munch on so they're getting some good fiber because essentially with that protein, it would be like a human just eating cheese all day long, you know, and you can actually have problems with, uh, with your hogs getting bound up. And so, you know, talking about Paul's poop pictures, if you start to see, like, really bound up um, poop with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, grain, visible grain in it, you have to cut back on the ration because you might be kind of pushing it. But that being said, I've fed a lot of it out, and uh, I think the meat quality has been good out of it, and, uh, you know, it's a great a great resource. Nick, are you saying all those intestinal problems I've been having is the 10 pounds of cheese I'm eating every day? It could, it could be. You might want to might want to think about your dairy consumption there. So. I appreciate that. Um, you want to tell us what your pasture mix again went real quick because that was a really helpful Nick, um, what you, what you, that pasture oh, yeah. planting that you had. Yeah, you bet. Um, so we, um, we have been using, and uh, this is something we, we discussed with a few per- people, and uh, my wife has actually some education in this area, so that always helps. But um, we use a, a mix of annual and perennial rye, oats, field peas, um, canola, which is also known as rapeseed, uh, field radishes, and uh, sorghum sedan grass. 
And so, uh, you know, the annual rye is the first thing to come up. I always like using that in any mix because it's, it's, it's going to die after, you know, the first, after a season, but it provides a lot of shade and helps keep uh, your, suppress some of those uh, early uh, uh, germinating weeds as well. And then the perennial rye will kind of take in underneath of it. Um, you know, the oats have some good benefits. For one thing, pigs love oats and oat straw. Um, and the field peas, you're going to get some some protein out of. And we had pretty good germination. I was surprised when I walked out in the pasture, you know, after we'd gotten some good rain and things that were established. And I actually found peas out there, so that was nice to see. And the canola has been good in the mix because um, it is, uh, you know, cruciferous, and it really lasts past a lot of the frost. And so, you know, some of those pictures uh, earlier in the presentation, you know, you see some of those green things with everything else brown around it, and the, the pigs are still out there foraging on green you know, green leaves in November and December, which is, you know, a good thing in itself. Um, they'll dig up some of the radishes too, radishes too, and that helps, you know, break up the hard pan that they tend to create by walking on it. And the sorghum Sudan grass is just a really excellent, again, that's a hybrid, so it's not going to reproduce. It produces edible grain, but it's not going to um, come back up next year. And um, it adds a lot of structure to the soil, a lot of good uh, biomass. That's kind of a couple of things I'd add, Nick. I'm starting to rely a lot on uh, annuals as well because I'm starting to see them as replacement for my grain. So I'm, I I put kale in every mix. Um, kale is good for people, so it's I, I like it as well. Uh, beets as well. There's some great forage beets out there um, that can be super helpful. Uh, and also planting corn out there. In addition, uh, they can be kind of hard to, to establish a little bit, but pumpkins and squash are great as well. So I run a vegetable farm, so I turn my pigs out in the vegetables after after um, we've harvested everything that we I think is um, good for ourselves. So um, I think we do, was there another part of that question on uh, nutrition? Um, there was a question about have either of you tried fermenting? Uh, oh, fermenting, I have not, but I've talked to a lot of growers that do do fermented grains, and uh, anything fermented is good for hogs. It's good for their digestion. Uh, that's my opinion, and so I think fermented grain is good. Also, um, doing sprouted grains in the winter is really helpful as well. And that reminded me of something as well that uh, that Nick said. I have I have pigs eating kale today on December 9th here in Minnesota uh, because it's it's still established out there. So that's helpful. And I think that uh, overall, when it comes to holistic herd health, the pasture is what makes it forgiving. So Nick and I can put out extra spent grains or things like that because we know that pigs, if they don't want it or, or can, you know, it's not good for them, they're going to go out and get some pasture. That's where they're going to get a lot of their fiber and so much of their nutrients as well. So I really see pasture as a forgiving part of what you give the hogs overall. I'd like to mention two other things really quick. Um, one was uh, in what Paul was saying, too, and thinking about parasite load and the idea of rotational pasture for a number of reasons, including parasite load, is one really good resource is if you have a good processor, if you have a good locker, I always call after I bring hogs in the next day or two while it's fresh in their minds from the slaughter and ask them about what the inside of my carcass is. And I know Paul uh, alluded to, you know, doing that yourself, and I do do some, you know, processing for us on the farm occasionally. But, you know, people who see pig livers and pig lungs and pig intestines all day long have a pretty good idea of what's a good-looking set of organs and what's not. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that we must be doing something right because we've had a very low parasite load um, as, as described by our processor at, at Story City. So, um, And I wanted to mention one other, other thing, too. Um, uh, uh, Paul had mentioned forage beets and some things like that. And um, I really like those things. I would say that if you're one of the people that may have tuned into the, this because of uh, the fact that I happen to raise Cooney Coonies, um, it is something that you have to watch with them. Um, and it's something that I watch as well with the spent brewer's greens because they're a bit sugary. And some of these uh, heritage breeds do, uh, including Cooney Coonies, do have a propensity for diabetes. And so you can actually, uh, you really have to watch their sugar intake essentially. Okay, thank you. I want to do a quick time check. So we're at um, 4 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Central. So that's about when we we're going to end. However, we have a dozen more questions from the audience. Um, Paul and Nick, um, do you want us to end on time or do you want it to take a little more time to answer questions? Uh, either way, we can um, send questions to you via email for you to answer as a follow-up, or we can keep going depending on your availability. So just wanted to check in with you since we're at um, the end of our schedule time.
Yeah, I've got about 10 more minutes, and then uh, I'll, so if we want to keep rolling through them, that sounds good to me. Yeah, okay, like, like, Nick, how about you? 10 minutes? Yeah, that sounds okay. fine. All right, well, let's try to, we'll try to keep um, answers as succinct as possible. And those that we don't get to, please know, folks, that um, we will, um, you know, you can email your questions. We have a little survey afterwards, and there's a spot where you can write in your questions. So if it doesn't get answered, please write it in, and we will get you in touch with um, Paul and Nick afterwards. Um, all right, moving on, we have a question from Crystal Beecham. When doing rotational grazing, is it bad to maintain a central feed, watering, and wallow area? My answer to that is no, um, uh, it, but no, I, I don't think it's a bad. I, I think there, there, there has always been a general assumption that parasite load can go up in, in a central feed area, um, and I'm, I, I'm not a scientist by any means, um, but I've had some people kind of question that a little bit. I'm not sure, you know, if good natural health can really help. Like Nick was saying, you're doing something right, and so by having good natural health, that is what controls parasites overall. So um, if you can rotate them to help break up the parasites, that's great. Um, but I don't think there's anything wrong. You're not going to – you're not a train wreck. A lot of people say, hey, am I a train wreck waiting to happen because there's a central area? And the answer to that is no if you can have um, good nutrition. So if you can rotate, that's great. But it's, it's, you can also do it very successfully with, with, um, with uh, a central feeding and watering area. I agree with that exactly. I don't even really think I have anything to add that was really succinct. So. Okay, great, thank you. Here's a question from Heidi Potter. At what age do your piglets get access to your free choice minerals? I think this one's for Paul. Um, I put, actually mix the free choice minerals in with their feed when they're piglets um, because they're not strong enough to open up the, the, the mineral feeder with their heads. So it probably wouldn't be it probably until about two months until they're, they are um, – getting in there to do that. So I would mix it in with the feed right away. And the, the, the feed, that's mixed, I'm mixing that in with the feed with the sows as well, because the way it's set up right now, my sows, when they're, after they are, after they birth, are not, uh, don't have access to the mineral feeders, so I just mix it right in. And so the, the piglets are getting the same feed as the pigs, um, and then up until I'd say two months, uh, and then I can kind of reliably let them go into those mineral feeders. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question from Doniel Freeman. Any tips on raising pigs in a cold, dry climate, such as Colorado? Nick? <laughs> I've certainly had some I've certainly had some winters. Uh, I was previously in South Dakota and I've had some pretty cold, dry winters there. And really, I mean I think the moisture is something that you battle. So I, I don't think the temperature is, is really too big of a deal. I mean, obviously I know when I'm out exerting myself in the winter time, and it's and there's such a low, uh, you know, relative humidity that I get thirsty a lot. But other than the basic requirements that you'd need either way, I, I think that, that it it really would not be a, a big deal, uh, you know, as far as the dryness goes. Um, I guess I would say if you were trying to, uh, you know, have hogs on a larger area, that it's possible that uh, some of those those plants might be more sparse in a dry climate, so it might be easier to you know, graze that down to nothing or overgraze if you had them out past season in an area like that. Paul, do you have any experience with that? Uh, not that specific item, but I, I, there's another question that's up there about the person who raises hogs in tradition, not, not on traditional pasture. It says, our hogs are on woodland, pines for one area, and oaks for another. And this is kind of the permaculturist in me coming out, but to, to say, what should you plant um, for your hogs to eat? And the answer to me is, what is growing well on your farm or in your bioregion? already those are the things that you typically are going to want to plant as at least as perennials so on my area for example grapes go really well and so do black raspberries now that might not be something that i would intentionally plant necessarily for hogs although i've done a little bit of it but it, so if you look in your area where it's dry and cold drive around and look at what is naturally growing around there as well uh, maybe not in your farm, but on your neighbor's farms. And then you can look to see what are some neighboring or what are some things that are genetically similar that you could plant as a, to be able to grow. Because one thing that can be really frustrating and time-consuming is trying to get something to grow for your hogs on your farm that doesn't naturally grow well there. You can spend a lot of time doing that. You want things that naturally grow easily and, um, and then kind of work from there. Great. Um, here's another question, this one from Josh Lark. Um, have either of you raised mangalitsa pigs on a barley-based diet? I have not. I do want to say one thing, though, that um, you want to make sure that your pigs get enough protein and that they have lysine as well, because I've worked with a few producers even this year as well who are giving their hogs tons of 
calories, but not enough protein, and that can produce a really lardy hog. And I know mangalitsas are lardy, and the lard is really good and all that, which is awesome. But um, you want to make sure that they get enough uh, protein from that diet and lysine as well. But I, I can't speak to that specifically. Can you, Nick? Um, not specifically to that breed, although I would say that coonies are also a lardy pig, and, um, you know, it's very easy for me to overfeed them, um, especially because, I mean, if I, I notice if I, if I skip chores for a day, the next morning I, I wake up and they're all out grazing in the pasture. And guess what? If I, if I feed them every morning at exactly the same time, everybody's just standing there waiting for feed. You know, I mean, they're, they're going to take the easiest option. And so, I mean, obviously you don't want to starve your pigs into eating something that they're not that excited about. But at the same time, it's kind of like the kid in the candy store, you know. So, I mean, I think there's a good, there's a good balance there. Here's a question from Kate Mendenhall. For a feeder pig operation with very limited housing infrastructure, mostly rotationally grazed pasture, which breeds do you recommend? Do some of the smaller breeds like Cooney and Cooney allow for less grass destruction? Um, I would say that, you know, you have to watch it a little bit with Coonies because, again, they, they do get lardy on you, although they're one of, the, one of the reasons I believe they do that is because they can fatten so well off of pasture. Um, now, with mine, I don't know if I, I assume it can – Lisa, can everyone still see the last slide right now? Uh, yeah, they should be able to see the one that says, please type your questions with a photo from your farm. So I was, yeah, so I was just going to say, like, with, with my crossbreed, they're crossbred uh, Osaba and Cooney Cooney. And so the ones that tend to take on more of the, the Cooney Cooney style features, you see the one that's uh, kind of uh, in the sun by the water tank there is a very short nose. And short nose pigs are more, great, more uh, designed for grazing and not shoveling into the the pasture and, and rooting a lot, whereas the Ossabaws, some of these ones with the longer nose, like the one in the foreground, are going to are gonna be more prone to root up. I mean, do they all root? Yes, to some extent, but, you know, I think that some of the shorter nose varieties are, are better for grazing. I, yeah, and I had put in my slides to, you know, try to find somebody that's raising them close to you and then go and visit another farm, I think, is a helpful way to do it. But raising hogs on pasture uh, even ferrying on pasture is great. Uh, the farther north you get, it can definitely produce a challenge. But um, uh, to echo what uh, Nick had said uh, a while ago, I, I know some some people who raise hogs in the winter, farrow in the winter with no supplemental heating, very successfully as well. So it's just a uh, wind protection is probably the number one thing I would say. And, and again, any of your heritage breeds that have a longer hair, do you, do the Osabas have some long hair, Nick or no? Oh yeah, yeah, they yeah, do. So. Yep, Just red wattles that I raise have long hair. The Berkshires have long hair. Uh, large blacks have, I wouldn't say as much hair, but they're definitely winter hardy as well. But it does sound, too, just, just from the question, that I think, you know, what Paul said in his presentation earlier is, is probably a good thing to point out, and that's, you know, um, it might not be the best idea at first to get too breed-centric. I think the idea of Paul saying, Find out what's available locally. That's something you have support for, and you know, find a reputable person you can get something for for a decent price. I mean, I always hear about people, you know, going out and spending six or seven hundred dollars for a breeding pair of some specific type of hog. And you know, if you don't have a lot of experience with hogs, I wouldn't get too set on one type of breed because it's just going to mean you're going to have to get them from farther away and probably pay more than the experience might be worth. I would say. I would, I would agree with that. And, you know, hogs are awesome. Even, you know, even your conventional hogs, if you take those and put them on pasture, they're beautifully smart animals. And so getting that experience without spending a lot of money is really helpful. All right. Thank you. Well, we're uh, 10 minutes past the hour. Um, so I think we're going to uh, wrap up our Q&A um, session. Thanks so much, Paul and Nick, for answering so many questions. Um, and there are a number that we didn't get to. Um, as I said, as we um, officially close out the webinar, it should audit, if you're looking at your screen, it should automatically take you to our survey, which is very brief. And there should be a section where you can write in if you have any questions that were not answered. Um, so if your question didn't get answered, please write it into the survey. Um, I've been trying to see if I can um, copy and paste from the chat and it won't let me do it. So the only way we'll get the question is if you take the survey and uh, put that in there. I do want to plug one more thing really quick. I'm going to share this in the chat um, 
sidebar to everyone and it's a link to our humane farming forum so um it's through google groups and it's basically an email listserv and we have almost 200 uh humane sustainable livestock farmers on this uh email list and so if you don't happen to have neighboring farmers who are doing what you're doing and you want to um you know just casually ask and get feedback this forum is a really nice way to connect with people all over the country or who are farming in this way um so oh someone said the link is breaking i uh, just copy and paste uh the link into there or you can search for the humane farming forum in google groups sorry about that um so that's just a really nice way i just wanted to plug that that's one of the other things that we offer through the the fun of farmer project uh, is hosting that so feel free to join that community and uh, please take the survey and uh, thank you all for being with us and thanks to Nick and Paul for their wonderful presentations. Thanks for having us. All right. Bye-bye everyone. Thanks.